Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking more at Ceph, which is a scale-out storage system, right after this. So today I'm going to be talking about Ceph. I, we kind of touched on it yesterday in the live stream, by the way. That was a lot of fun. Sure enjoyed that. Hope you did too, though, those of you that got a chance to uh, join us. I don't know how often I'm going to try to do those. I need to do it more often, and I've set up to be able to handle the stream. So maybe once a week, we'll try that and see how it goes. We'll do a live Wednesday or something. But Ceph is uh, really, it, it's like I said yesterday, it is a scale-out storage system. But it does belong to a class of systems also for that are, that are software-defined storage. Uh, and you can implement that with Ceph. Oh, oh, oh. Let's, before we jump down that 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 uh, rabbit hole, let's go for, talk about Ceph a little bit first. So the move is to the cloud, right? Everybody's trying to get over to the cloud, try to save money, try to push their stuff over there. However, there's still some organizations that have some data they don't want to share with the cloud because they don't want to put it at risk for being stolen. Uh, we've been, you know, it seems like every few months we read of a major data spill that happens because somebody forgot to protect their uh, data stores in the cloud. So they forgot to put a password lock on it, or they forgot to encrypt it. I mean, and I suspect that will keep happening. Human nature is what it is. I mean, we're and not we're not uh, we're not perfect. That's for sure. I mean, a lot of times we just try to set things up really fast, and then we forget to do the obvious to make sure that things are protected, and then we get into trouble. But uh, the trend for a while has been to move away from NAS, but more particularly SAN, uh, into <clears throat> commodity-based hardware. So <clears throat> what do we mean by that? So SAN can be uh, quite expensive, obviously, because you have a lot of specialized pieces of hardware, which allows it to link together all the storage within the system. And NAS can be too, because you usually have <clears throat> hardware arrays that are linked together. They might have uh, fiber channel access and, and those kinds of controllers can get quite expensive along with the routers that you need to, re to connect that infrastructure together. Not to mention <clears throat> the fiber optic network itself can get quite expensive depending upon the speeds and feeds of your particular fiber channel. <clears throat> so, yeah, so not that you probably that that necessarily will wash away, but the idea is for SAP to come in, give us commodity storage and allow us to utilize hard drives or SSDs or NVMEs and pools and then build them up and kind of share it. You know, Hadoop really is the one that started this, right? I mean, a lot of people didn't really think too much about their, hey, you got two drives on the front of the machine that are just sitting there. Uh, why don't you stick some hard drives in there and use that as an ancillary storage? And then if they're on a network, you can, you can cluster all those drives together and start to form a larger system, a larger pool of data that you can then use for something else. In Hadoop's case, it was used for analytics. But in Ceph's case, you can use it for anything you want. So, I mean, that's really the, that's really the idea behind it, and that is, but it does require some software to manage it, right? So I need to have something to manage all that data so I can access it, so I can grow it, and I can be able to make it accessible to different kinds of clients. And that is software-defined storage. But what is that? So SDS is nothing more than technology that tries to reduce the cost of the growing data store. So it, it, it tries to help you manage it without having to have a whole bunch of complex hardware. And it decouples that storage management system from the hardware. So trying to keep things simple doesn't try to have, I mean, you don't have to go out and buy these half a million dollar storage systems in order to be able to implement things. But in short, just allows you to use your commodity-based hardware as a, as a storage pool and allow it to tie all together, no matter how many machines it's on, how many networks it's across. So STSs usually have all kinds of rules associated with them. They say, you know, you have to have these 15 things and then you can call yourself an SDS. I've seen some of that uh, in the advertising for different pieces of software that 
different companies are selling. But you really only need two things in an SDS, I, my opinion, is you need a metadata tagging for the data store. You need to be able to find it when you do access it or to change it. But uh, you also need policies to determine how does it get protected? How long does it get this stick around? When does it get moved off to archival storage? Because uh, usually most of our storage networks today have usually some kind of tiering where I have high speed drives that are limited in storage that I use for everyday access so that it's really quick and fast. I might have some kind of mid tier storage in case, you know, it's applications that are running kind of overnight. They don't, they don't need to run as fast as possible. They just need to get done in a certain amount of time. And then I might have some that are just classed as, well, this is stuff that I might need in a search occasionally. I don't know how often it's going to be so, but I don't really want to dedicate really high speed hardware to it. I'll just put it on this archival store and that probably might be spinning disk in order to do that. So the architecture looks a little bit like this, where I have clients, I have hosts and VMs, I have applications that are trying to access some man data management layer to get to the system that is storing all of my data. So at the bottom, I have all this commodity hardware that's uh, either sticking out of the front of the machine or it's inside of cards that are on PCI risers, or they might even be on the motherboards of the machines themselves. But how does Ceph fit in as a SDS? Well, open source, the fact that it's open source has nothing to do with it being an SDS, but it does help because it makes it available to all of us for free, right? But Ceph really belongs to a class of storage solutions that are called distributed object stores. And distributed object stores basically means I can put storage on all these different machines, and then I can use my network to push to collect all that all storage pools together and make it look like one or many. I can divide it up any way I want. Uh, it was designed by Sage Well in uh, 2014, and in that same year, Sage created uh, a, a company called Inktap, Ink Tank Storage. And two years later, Red Hat was interested enough in uh, and acquired uh, Ink Tank uh, software, so that became part of Red Hat. But Red Hat didn't want this to just be, you know, Red Hat is very conscious about uh, open source. And so they wanted to make sure that this was going to be available to the community inside of Linux at large. And so they formed the Ceph Community Advisory Board, and that is a consortium of Canonical, CERN, Cisco, Fujitsu, Intel, Red Hat, SanDisk, and SUSE. And, I, and I've been looking through some of the information that SUSE has on Ceph, and I was kind of impressed. They, they really have a pretty large offering for, uh, for uh, SUSE that uh, and implements different areas and different aspects of Ceph. I mean, they, they actually have documents that talk about, you know, here's, the, here's some rules of thumb that you can use to size it and when to size different things and add on different components. Uh, here's some recommended uh, reference architectures that you can follow for setting this up, what you might do if you're storing video, what you might do. You know, it's very application-oriented, and it's all very good. And I haven't seen too much of that from some of the others just yet. Now, Red Hat's focus, of course, is on their software, uh, and so it's more focused on deploying virtual machines. So, And they, they're they more interested in that. But I think SUSE has taken more of a a broader view of it from not just storing virtual machines, but also data at large and databases and so forth. Everything, the whole picture, right, of all the data that we have to worry about. So in the client architecture, if I put Ceph down on that diagram that I had before, it would look something like this. And my, across the top, I have my clients and my host VMs and my applications. And then I have Ceph file services accessing, being accessed from the client because the clients have Windows or maybe a Linux workstation, maybe a Mac that they're using to access the file stores under it. Uh, and then the host VM is accessing the block storage. So that could be databases, that could be virtual machines. But then I have applications that are interested in the object stores. And that might be video, it might be audio, it might be you know huge pools that are going after that. And then all those go through the live RADOS, which is the basically the API level layer for the RADOS underneath of it, which is where you're going to find your monitors, your managers, your OSD servers that have the storage systems in it. So everything on the RADOS is all actually inside the commodity hardware, right? 
Uh, there's a number of nodes that Ceph uh, defines. Now, one of them I don't have on here is the manager node. The manager node is really kind of the GUI into the now into the system. So it's kind of your dashboard for your Ceph storage network. It's optional. You don't have to install it. Uh, you can get client information from the admin uh, if you want. But this is kind of a nice GUI where you can kind of track and see things running in real time and how well your system is performing and how things have been tuned well or not well. You can see all of that from the, uh, the GUI. The metadata server is also optional, but this one is really caching the metadata server that's made of data that has been collected uh, from the OSDs. Then you have a monitor, which is kind of looking across the, all of the systems and determine whether it needs to re I mean, start up a new one or, or start pushing data to another OSD because maybe you have one that's temporarily down because of a failure of some kind. Uh, and then you have the object uh, storage devices themselves, the OSDs. These nodes contain all your storage devices, and you have to have at least two of those. You, uh, monitor, I think... You only need one, but typically, I, I think the rule of thumb is something like you, you kind of want three uh, in order for them to reach a consensus. Um, now, you can start out with one, and then as you start your OSDs, you start growing up, you're gonna, and you get up to like 15 OSDs, you're going to have three monitors. That's what I've always heard anyway. And then you add two additional monitors for every 15 OSDs you add after that. It's kind of a rule of thumb that I've kind of heard. But uh, yeah, anyway. So the storage architecture, if I put that back on the diagram that I had, I now start to see that CephFS starts to fill in the role for the file systems to the client. The RBD is my block storage to my host and my VMs, and then the object storage is going up to applications that need object stores. Uh, then my monitors are sitting down in the cluster uh, storage network or RADOS, and also my OSD daemons, daemons, excuse me, would have the nodes that contain the disk drives and the file media and all that stuff, the NVMEs or SSD, whatever I'm storing to. So each cluster, in, in, if you think of Ceph as one large cluster, so there's a map, and that map is for the entire cluster of Ceph machines and Ceph servers. There are five different maps that are inside of that cluster map. So the first one you have is the monitor map. That's the list of each monitor machine that's out there. It's running Ceph monitor. Uh, and then you have OSD, which is your storage map, that contains the list of OSD servers, the pools, because you can you can divide up that large pool of data into smaller ones. And then my replica size, how often and how many replicas I keep for data. Uh, and then my status, of course, of what's going on in the network and on my OSDs. The uh, placement group is uh, the details on your PG map. I'm not going to get into PG, the placement group in this. It's probably beyond what we really need to worry about. The crush map is something fairly new. Uh, that's a list of the storage devices and the failure domain hierarchies, and also the hierarchy rules for uh, how I how I process different things through the system. But the crush is is I think that was implemented in the last release prior to the current one. Um, but that is something to try to improve performance quite a bit in the Ceph. Uh, Ceph system. Then you have the MDS map, which is the meta pool data list, or the, the metadata pool list, the metadata pool, and then the status of those as well. So, and each OSD can replicate data to other OSDs, and this relieves, the, relieves that Ceph client from having to do that. And certain storage kind of, uh, in certain storage solutions, the client has to do all that replication work. It doesn't take place back on the servers. Uh, and yeah, self clusters can get quite large. They can be in the multiple petabyte range. Um, I did see something in one of the documents that was talking about exabyte, but uh, I'm not aware of any current commercial systems or government systems that have reached exabyte needs yet. I, I know some of them are getting really close. Uh, as far as the runtime architecture, uh, so this would be kind of what it would look like. You'd have clients connected to the live RADOS. And so this is kind of another exploded view of what we were already talking about. And this would have the MDS servers, the monitors, the OSDs, and then my drives. 
Uh, what would it look like deployed though? So I probably would create a, a, a provisioning network, which would be a one gig network. It doesn't need to be extremely fast uh, because all you're doing with that is you're sending commands to create additional Ceph nodes and attach them and define how many monitors, you, you know, change your definition of the monitors, change the definition of the OSDs, how many you have, what's connected to them and so forth. So that's really kind of the setup. But the other two ones usually need to be 10 gig or larger. Uh, and that would be your public network. So the one that you're using from access to clients. And then the secondary one, which is the cluster network, is just how the communication occurs between all of the Ceph nodes. So you need that because you've got replication going across there and you've got messages, you've got traffic, you've got status, you've got a lot of stuff tra traversing that. You don't want to put that onto uh, your uh, public network. That would burden it and slow down clients trying to access the data. So in summary, uh, Ceph is, is integrated into the OpenStack virtualization infrastructure. Not a big surprise there since that's a Red Hat technology. Uh, but you can also use Ceph object stores and block storage with uh, virtual machines. Uh, KVM, for example, and Proxmox both have integrations into uh, uh, into Ceph. XCP and Zen, however, require a plugin, and it's called the, the RBD SR. Uh, so it needs that uh, plugin in order to work. Otherwise, you're going to have to implement it as some sort of iSCSI based target uh, in order to do that. So that's all I really had today for this. I wasn't planning on going uh, into a lot of depth with it and, you know, explaining all the details of it. I was just wanting to kind of follow up on the discussion yesterday and explain more about what Ceph is because as I had noticed in my in, in my videos in the past, I just kind of mentioned Ceph in passing and didn't really cover it very well. So today I'm trying to make up for that misstep and that's what Ceph really is. Um, and Ceph in the old days was quite hard to install. And it, it, it used to be just, I mean, there were guys that could do it pretty easily in a matter of minutes. But some of us that, like me, <laughs> it would be hit and miss. Trying to do things on ARM with Ceph, I don't know how it is now, but it, it was, uh, sometimes it would work and next, next, time, next machine you brought up, it would fail. So I, yeah, it just, it was just hit and miss with ARM. And, and I don't, and it would be weird errors. I mean, it would be permission errors, and then you'd fix the permissions, and it'd give you some other error about some availability of a file that didn't get laid down properly. But uh, Ceph was generally considered pretty hard. But that has changed. Um, the new methods that they have now for installing Ceph are much improved. They're not the they're not the Ceph deploy methods that were in the past. Um, they actually have Ceph Ansible now, and there's also this new technology that they have developed through, I think it's called the Ac Acu. Acu, I think, is the uh, actual admin client now that they're using, which kind of implements all of the uh, pieces together. So I might try that at some point, but it probably won't be on ARM. I'll probably do that one last. I'll probably try x86 first and then see if I can get that work. And if I can, I'll come back and demo it to you. That's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, if you like this, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.